Now, before we get started, we couldn't possibly put on the show without our sponsors. So, if you haven't yet heard of or tried Heights, then what are you waiting for? You might already have a daily hair care and skincare routine, so it's about time that you made brain care just as important. It's what most of our secret leaders now add to their daily lives, trusting Heights to look after their most important organ for long-term health and nearer-term mental performance using a mix of plant-based omega-3s and key nutrients that science says our brains need to thrive, delivered through your letterbox every month. Listeners of this show can get £10 off a quarterly subscription with the code LEADERSHEIGHTS at yourheights.com. And I want to take a moment to let you know about the immense e-commerce marketing platform called Klaviyo. It's what I've been using at my own startup since we got going to get a full 360 degree view of my customer and I've not looked back since. Plus the fact that 50,000 other e-commerce businesses use it to find out what their customers are doing so they can analyze and act on it to convert means that they're the perfect solution. Whether your scale is from your first million to your first billion, Klaviyo will set you up for success on that journey so just visit klaviyo.com forward slash secret leaders. That's K-L-A-V-I-Y-O.com forward slash secret leaders today to find out more. And if you're fed up of scrolling through jobs on LinkedIn, I think you're going to love Otter. They've handpicked the most exciting jobs at tech companies in London. Now, many of these fantastic companies have been featured on secret leaders already, and they've got job openings on Otter too. For example, Slack, Bulb, Go Cardless, and Deliveroo. So, Otter is building a place for smart, ambitious people to find their new career challenge. Just find out more at otter.com, that's O T T A dot com, and find your new job there. Now to today's show. Hello, I'm Dan Murray Serta, and you're listening to Secret Leaders from Infamous Media. We invite great entrepreneurs to share their stories of how they built their businesses so you can get inspiration and ideas to succeed in your career. Today's guest started his company in 2006 when he was just 19 years old. Sam Matthews is the co-founder and CEO of Fnatic, one of the leading esports teams in the world, an industry which is blowing up not just because of Sam, but definitely he plays a big part of it. So Sam, straight into it with a quick fire round. Cats or dogs? Dogs. Don't listen, Archie. Uh, (laughs) Xbox or PlayStation? PlayStation. Mario Kart or GoldenEye? Oh, uh, that's that's a real bad (laughs) Probably uh, Mario Kart just because it was... uh, I mean, GoldenEye was incredible, but like, it's too hyped. You know? Yeah, it's funny. I, 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 when I was writing that, I was like, oh, I don't know what my answer is. I think, I think I'd end up with GoldenEye, to be honest. But yeah, yeah. those two. Four. GoldenEye is the cooler answer. Mario Kart's sure. like the you know cliche kind of cheesy answer. No, mate, Diddy Kong Racing is the cooler <laughs> answer. Um, <laughs> kale or broccoli? Kale. Oh my god! Actually, I love broccoli too. This is that is, uh, broccoli. I'm going to switch up to broccoli. Uh, uh, talent or dedication? Uh dedication and you can take three things with you to a desert island what are they going to be um broccoli mario kart and a woman <laughs> <laughs> love it not your girlfriend just a woman i mean my girlfriend <laughs> sorry i mean obviously like you know you gotta have company. you'll say what you're given so, yeah exactly you know yeah, just fair enough the op- we gotta build a family so i was thinking more survival yeah you yeah know. well i hope uh, she likes I mean, broccoli i mean you could survive on broccoli i think i mean theoretically maybe, maybe. and then you can make uh, babies and eat them if you need protein right? you can survive on mario kart at least, <laughs> so it's fine. Yeah. um all right let's let's start at the start what was your childhood like uh i mean it was like playing a lot of rugby in australia but also traveling so i was like going from england where i grew up uh until i was six and then i moved to hong kong when i was six until nine and then i moved to australia um and then i came back when i was 17 so it was kind of like a a bit of a jumping around and kind of being brought up by by my mother and and um and my two older brothers so you know a lot of bullying a lot of (laughs) trying to be the 
the the big one and 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 compete with them all the time, which I think is probably what drove me to be such a competitor because it's like it's pretty hard to compete with somebody who's older than you when you're mm. like six. <laughs> yeah, and like physically, right? It's completely yeah. unfair advantage. Totally. I only realized that recently. I was like, oh yeah, I was the younger brother. That's why I was never as good as them because they were always two years older than me. Like it's a weird, it was a weird realization when you like, you just didn't think about it as a kid, yeah. you know, you was just like, oh, it's insane. Did you have, um, did you have entrepreneurship in your family? Were people into that? What were you supposed to be doing? Did they push down a certain path? Yeah. So I think, you know, Firstly, like my mom has always been quite, um, you know, she's a doer, right? You know, if you're into human design and she's a manifesting generator, which is uh, basically somebody who's always on the go, always trying to find something to do, um, never complacent. That's why she's able to like look after like three boys um, uh, on her own and then also run a physiotherapy practice. And then like, you know, and then, and then when I started Fanatic, she joined like full-time in Fanatic for 10 years. So, um, but then, you know, outside of that, I guess, you know, my uncle was like the CEO of Kellogg's. So I don't know if it's like, that is entrepreneurial. And my granddad, you know, he kind of traveled the world and then settled like as a veterinary practice in New Zealand from like a, being a farm hand in Scotland. So it's, it, but no one's who's like started companies that have been successful, if you sort of. Mm. Mm. That's really interesting. Lots of different, um, uh, I'd say different curiosities, like permeating through different people in your in your family. So, um, and, and amazing that your mum joined so, so young. So could we talk about that for a moment? So what was that experience like? So when did your mum join? How did you have that conversation? How did she go from physiotherapy practice to was she just like working on people's like fingers and uh, hand joints now? <laughs> <laughs> no, so, I mean, like the, the reality is, is that like, obviously, uh, you know, as a kid that you don't know much about starting a business and, and like, I'm not one of those kind of, I guess, more academic led entrepreneurs who read about it in books for years and you know, dreamed of being an entrepreneur from when I was a kid. It was just kind of something that like, I just did, you know, I started like, yeah, same. can I sell everything in the house? Like, mom, I want to do a garage <laughs> sale, you know, like, <laughs> like, well, let's set up like a lemonade stand as a cliche thing, just because I see it on, and that type of thing. And then, you know, I uh, basically ended up playing a lot of video games because I was, um, you know, playing a lot of rugby and then I'd come home and it, like my brother showed me the Quake 3 where you could play against other people. Um, and it was just hooked. I was like, wow, I can actually get the thrill of competition at like any time, you know, rather than having to like wait for someone to play a board game with me or to go on a football pitch or you know, rugby pitch. It was, it was something that you could just like pick up and like play and compete. And that was such a thrill to me. Um, and you know, so I, I really got into it at uni when I kind of went to a dorm in Southampton and had a hundred megabit internet in like 2004, which was quite a, quite a good uh, internet connection back then. Um, and because of that, I was like, wow, this is naturally going to be like huge. You know, when, when internet goes everywhere, when devices get better, when the games get better, you know, people love to compete. Like, of course they're going to want to compete all of the time, any of the time. Um, and so I sold my car and I sent a team to, uh, the United States to play in a tournament, which they won. Um, and you know, in that summer, and that was just before summer holidays. And then the summer holidays, I went, um, I went back home and my mom was like, what happened to your car? And I was like, well, you know, I kind of sold it this thing and do this thing. And she was like, I got a bit angry. And then she was like, well, if you're going to do it, let's do it right. You know, I'll put in some money and you can put in some money from your, your uncle's inheritance, which was like, I don't know, 20K each or something like that. <laughs> um, and, and I'm going to come on and I'm going to run finance. I'm like, okay. So I gave her half the business, you know, like <laughs> it was kind of like, it was like that. And that's how she got involved at the beginning. That's so was, interesting. Yeah. So is your mom technically a, an equal shareholder to you? Uh, she was for a long time. Um, and I stepped out. I mean, there's obviously a lot happened. Yeah, we'll come. I... We'll come on. We'll come on to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. I mean, let's take the let's take the story sequentially. But um, you know, let's just to go back a second. So, you know, you're at university. You've sold your car. Yeah. You um, have got really into gaming. But then you mentioned, you know, you sent a team off to the states. What does that really mean? Like what? Like and especially in the context of you know that might sound a bit more normal now if you're listening and you're into esports. That might sound somewhat normal now i guess the normal listeners that don't know much about esports it's still weird then that was really odd so let's just talk about that for a second what does it mean to send off a team and why weren't yeah. you in the team why weren't you there with them well 
that's the thing is that like I'd kind of quickly become like uh, you know as soon as you start like organizing and managing it like takes a lot of time right so I started like oh if I if I'm gonna get a sponsorships I then need to get like the best players and then I need to be in the best games and already we'd launched like you know uh, yeah so it was kind of like this idea where I'd stumbled into basically running a team I was playing for called Creaturin, which was this terrible team um, name, especially. Um, and it was kind of like, I tried to like, you know, I guess it was like an entrepreneur. I tried to like, I re did the website, did the branding, I created a sales deck, I did all these things to try, because I wanted to go to an event. I wanted to get sent to this event and I didn't have the money to send myself there. And I, I sent off like, I don't know, maybe a hundred emails to different like sponsors, you know, really long wordy emails that I get like every day now from like 19 year olds. But I sent one off myself to lots of people. And one guy sat back and said like, well, you know, here's the thing about marketing, you know, like you actually need to have like, good exposure and good branding and good good website and I was like yeah actually this 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 makes sense and that and and, and you need to be the best um and so that's when I basically started to think about creating fanatic and I you know did it at uni and I got my dorm room guy to draw the logo the first version my, my mate who definitely wasn't an artist <laughs> um and 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 eventually like uh, it was like we launched and the big first big tournament I was like well how am I gonna I picked up the best teams I could find in Europe and I knew they were the best in the world um but the tournaments were in America so I, I was like I need to get this team there and I made a deal with them that if I send them there that I get like my money back plus 20 percent basically and they won of course and yeah. and um and that was like the start of it right it was like I got my money back I have some money in the bank but I probably need some more money because I need to send more teams to different places um so you know it was kind of like that but yeah no, you're right like how, like it was such a small scene right like it was people on the internet on internet relay chat you know irc um and it was like you know maybe thousands of people not hundreds of millions of people right so but it still felt like a scene and probably like ultimate especially because it's online because you can like talk to everybody and it feels like something that's that's big do you like did you so was there no like an option of just doing this remotely anyway? Like what was the reason that you had to go to these physical tournaments, even though it was online? Did you guys find that like a massive barrier or is the whole point that that's a barrier and it kind of forces you into professionalizing it a bit? Yeah. So, I mean, the number one reason, and it's to this day still very relevant, but also was also very extremely relevant, relevant back then was that, if you go to an offline event, uh, you're actually on the set level playing field, right? You've got the same internet connection. So everyone's on zero ping, there's no latency. Uh, and also on top of that, everyone's on the same PC. So okay. it's the only way for it to be fair. Like, and that's the, 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 the reality is like back then, you know, everybody had like, some people had ISDN and dial up and stuff like that. So, you know, to, 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 to really have true competition. And, and, and it was kind of like, it was like the Mecca, you know, going to this location where everybody's on like zero ping. It means that it's all about just the pure skill of the teams, you know? Mm. Okay. Let's, let's get a bit of understanding for listeners at this point before we go even deeper. So, yeah. um, let, can you help us define esports? So, like, I like literally. I've been friends with you for years, and I only <laughs> only about two years ago actually understood what uh, what esports teams do. It was so fascinating to me. So, can you actually break it down? Like, what is a typical esports team? Um, yeah. How do you guys set up? Um, are there particular games that you guys like gravitate away from? Do you try and do all of them? Is it about like picking the ones that you're best at? Like, take us through like literally for the layman. And my mom listens to all my secret leaders, so, you know. <laughs> well, then I'll, I'll start with, like, well, did you just think I was some sort of, like, busty camp party organizer or something? Like, <laughs> is that how you, that's how we knew each other. I mean, yeah, I, I, I just thought you were a straight-up weirdo. But, yeah, okay. Um, just, awesome. like, oh, that is confirmed. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. So, so, I mean, look, it's if you think about sport, it's really simple, right? Sports are games. Every one of them, you know, whether it's ultimate frisbee, whether it's you know tennis, whether it's basketball, you know, often it's like ball in net, ball over net, you know, ball around net, whatever, you know. Like there's, it's some sort of game, some sort of game, and 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 at the end of the day, those the you know, they're sports, they're very serious, you know, there's physical, but they're games. And the reality is, is that you know, games, as in the ones that we play on the computer, are 
like super engaging and they're much more engaging in some ways than, than some of these like physical sports or and tactical games. and tactical. And so, and, and they're also like unlimited in terms of imagination, right? You can pretty much do anything that you want. Like, you know, is this person zero gravity? Like, are they like having laser pointers out of their fingers? Like, like whatever you can imagine you can make. And so when you have a game, which is like limitless in kind of engagement and entertainment, it basically means that like the only difference between, you know, the games, which were all kind of like you know, GTA or you know, cyberpunk now is that you know, esports arrived when it was like, hold on a minute. Why don't we just make people play against each other on the internet, these games, then we don't need to make like hours and days of worth of content we can just make like the game that's balanced and that it's, it's got some basic rules and we let them compete against one another and it was the birth of esports so it's basically you know fair to play fair games where it's like there's a level playing field um and you can play over the internet you can play on any device you can play any time and and because of that it's so much more accessible. There's like probably around a billion to a billion and a half people playing online ranked competitive video gamers, video games ranked, meaning there is like actually built into the game. Like, you know, you're on level bronze, you're on platinum, you're on gold, you're on diamond. And so the, these are kind of basically like leagues that are built into the games, which you can play from anywhere you know, in Europe or whatever you want to do. And so what that led to is that obviously whenever you've got 100 million people playing something and there's the you and there's a level playing field there's the people who are insane right and they're the best of the best and they're the people that you want to watch and and actually it turns out that watching a game that you play is actually really exciting who would have thought you know like oh my god i play football watching football is really exciting like it's right, like the biggest youtuber <laughs> right PewDiePie, that's all about watching people play games yeah, and, and it's even yeah, okay. more engaging because they're they're able to talk to those people at the same time. You know, they're able to like engage with them in real time and be like, "Go left, go right, do this." You know, like uh, you know, and and like when they when they screw up, they they're there talking to their fans. So it's so basically, esports is born out of basically technical disruption of well, not disruption, but it's it's the addition of technology to games and and that, and, and sport, and that's basically what esports is, and it's kind of like just. It's, you know, it's been around for like 20 years, but at the same time, it's just beginning. Yeah. Okay. That is a great definition. And just before we then go back into the story, so how are you set up at Fnatic? So, you know, you talk, call yourself, when, when you first described it to me, you called yourself, you know, the, like the Manchester United of the esports world. Um, mm -hmm. I'm guessing you probably want to change that to, you know, Real Madrid or Barcelona at a time. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, it helps, it helps solidify the point. So what does that mean? Yeah, so look, I mean, I think... And, and sorry, and just to be clear, does that make you Alex Ferguson? Are you the coach or are you the owner, like the Glazers kind of thing? I'm probably more like the Glazers than I am Alex Ferguson okay. um, because I'm like kind of running the whole business. But, uh, you know, it's a very big comparison to make, so I'm not going to make that. But I'm going to say this, right? Ultimately, the, there's two major differences from us to like a Real Madrid or a Man United. And that's, firstly, we're in multiple games. So we're in anything that is, is, is an esports title. So, you know, whether that's League of Legends, Fortnite, FIFA, Call of Duty, we, we are in it or if they're big enough and we can go into it. So if any new game pops up in a new region or a new market, which inherently is super exciting and, and, and is an advantage because ultimately, you know, like Man United, they're kind of limited by, if they're doing badly, they're not actually able to like still buoy the brand with other areas. And the second major difference is that we also are you know, managing effectively creators. So we have these creators who are at the pinnacle of their kind of gaming prowess, but they're making content on YouTube, they're making content on Twitch, and, and they basically represent our brand. So it's like a hybrid between you know, a multi-sport um, sports team and a kind of uh, basically talent management brand a little bit like Nike manages talent or Gymshark has talent, et cetera. And so what that comes to be is that we are effectively an esports performance brand. So we don't actually consider ourselves as purely a team. We actually consider ourselves as representing the betterment of gaming, the pinnacle of gaming. Uh, and, and so, and that means that now we're producing our own clothing, we're producing our own hardware, like keyboard, we produce headsets, and we're actually very unique in that, and that no other team does that. Um, but if you had to break it down into like... I needed a collaboration one. with Gucci. 
Yes, we did. I'm actually not wearing the watch right now. <laughs> Otherwise, I'd show you. But I assume this is a podcast, so it's 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 a pretty watch, everyone listening. <laughs> but yeah, we did a collaboration. That's with That's amazing. But I mean, I mean, in all seriousness, like take a moment. Like you know, anyone listening, like that that is a great example because Gucci is you know arguably at the moment the number one fashion brand in the whole entire world, and you know to be doing a partnership you know, not something that they would take lightly. And, you know, if you could write a list of the people that you'd want to do a partnership with, you would be number one on that. So that is yeah. just unbelievable. Thank you. I mean, it was something that, you know, coming into 2020, you know, and I, if you'd asked me in 2019, like, can you imagine you would be here in, you know, in 2004? And the answer would have been like, yeah, that it's kind of makes sense. Um, but then if you ask me like, you know, six months later, if you imagine if I'd be where I was when we were announcing BMW and then Gucci, like, no, like, I think that's, that's the truth of it. Like, I never would have imagined that we would have created a, a collaboration with it, with it, with it, one of the pinnacle fashion houses in the world. The last time they did a collaboration was with the Yankees in 2018. Um, and it was, it was something that, you know, the creative director of Gucci met with our pro team, the League of Legends guys, and personally designed the watch. It was, it was, it was just insane. And, and obviously, like, you know, it's, it's something that hopefully we're going to do a lot more stuff in the future with, 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 with these types of brands. Um, but it is, it is surreal in some ways that, that a kind of gaming team is able to do that. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, okay. Let's thank you. That that was a really good summary, like overall. So now let's just go back because I think with, with something like esports, it is important to be, give people some really healthy context because it's just not something that everyone knows. So now let's go back. You are, um, you know, you've gone from Southampton. You've gone to this first, uh, first, first event. You've won, like you said, which is great. Your mum's obviously delighted because she's part shareholder with you. Um, What's that like? What what happens next? So like taking through the next two or three years, and you know, it's also worth saying that actually, um, you know, how we knew each other originally was actually um, you were running an agency on the side as well, Neverland. And yeah. so you know, is is this part of that journey also because you know there wasn't a lot of money involved in esports at the time, and you had to have another company going. Like take take us through totally. the actual journey as an entrepreneur, like making money, supporting yourself, like all of these things, because it's been a long journey for you. Yeah, so I mean, like, I started it when I was 19, you know, I, I basically grew it over the next three to four years. Uh, and, and the reality was that we were running, and I keep using this as a reference, basically, like, what an Ultimate Frisbee team is now was how big we were, right? It was, it's it's kind of a very small, um, it was before Twitch had even existed. It was before, you know, live streaming had taken off. It was even before YouTube had taken off, really. It was like the beginning of YouTube. And so it was like really hard to get brands interested. It was really hard to get media rights. And the reality was, was like, I'm running a team at the time. And it's like, the, the what, what is as an entrepreneur is super hard to get your head around is that like, you could do great things for the company but you can't manage if your team wins or not, right? It's it's actually like, you know, it, at the end of the day, it's it's and that's kind of depressing at some point. So for me, I got to the point where I was like, I don't know when this is gonna get there. It's gonna take a while. And I'm I'm like, you know, at the time I'm reading like TechCrunch every day. I'm like really thinking about building products and startups. And and that's basically, you know, I'd noticed that like uh, we'd created a website with profiles and we had like almost 100,000 people, you know, every week on our website, just chatting to each other. And I was like, what you, wait a minute, like, you know, Facebook is coming up, like gamers want to talk to each other. Doesn't it make sense to create a gaming social network? So I launched Ugame. Um, we got our first bit of outside funding. We launched on TechCrunch, like we had two articles on TechCrunch in the heyday of TechCrunch when it was like, there was no other tech press. It was like just TechCrunch and like some random other websites. It was 2007. Ashable. Yeah, Mashable. Yeah, it was probably before Mashable. Like mm -hmm. it was super early in the tech scene, and you know, we, I basically started running a tech product because I was like, I want to build a scalable company, which is kind of outside of. Out, and we got to three hundred thousand users. We you built a ten person team. I moved to London. You know, I was like, Where were you at the time? I was Southampton. So I did it all out of university. Happened. Yeah, right. for like five years, and then moved up to London. I was like, Wow, big city, so much opportunity. And then. Um, and basically I started pitching VCs and we got like pretty far down the line with Intel Capital and we'd gone, I went to Silicon Valley and I was like talking to them, you know, in London, turns out that one of my best friends in the world, who wasn't my best friend at the time, um, was Kieran O'Neill and he, uh, 
he had start he had started a gaming social network too at Playfire, and we were actually he had just raised from the London tech scene, and it was like you can't really have space in the London tech scene, which is about forty people at the time, um, to, uh, to, to 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 have two gaming social networks out of the one region. And then what happened was Lehman Brothers collapsed, um, and you know all the VC money dried up. You know our, our three hundred thousand users and a B two C advertising company where no advertising uh, wasn't really kind of what people wanted to invest into. So I kind of slowly wound that up, and I was like, "Well, I have two choices: I either go back to Fnatic and like you know know that I'm still kind of running an esports team, and it's like going to take a long time, and I don't know when it's going to be. It's an ecosystem thing rather than my." in my control to scale it, you know? Um, and so instead, the second option was to take the development team that I created and start building, you know, I'd become entrenched in the London tech scene and start working on, on other, you know, people's startups and, and helping them build their products. Um, and so that's basically what we did. We, we I launched Neverbland. It became like a product incubator. We, we I, I ran that and, you know, basically built up to a team of 40 designers, developers, um, we we started building other people's products. Like we worked on some companies like Bulb. Uh, we did their early product uh, in the design, especially EverPress. Uh, a number of London tech startups. You know, we we worked with at early doors. Um, but I kind of quickly got, you know, it's it's working for others, man. It's not it's not. I've never been able to do that. Even though it was my company, I just didn't really like. You know, I always wanted to run their companies, basically. And um, you know, so I ended up like basically bringing in a CEO and building my own startups off the profit of the agency. And I launched three startups inside of that agency. One of them was uh, called um, Voted. One of them was called Conjure, and another one was called Slate. And Slate was like an agency pitching tool, which you know. But basically, it was the end of the Neverland story because I sold it um, in, in in 2015, and 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 yeah, that kind of I can finish it up, or I've been talking for ages, so I kind of like yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. So, so so just take us through that though. So when you say like Slay sort of ended the Neverland story, do you mean um, as in you created a product there, and as soon as you had the sort of finality of selling that product, you were like, I'm done. I want to go back to Fnatic, or what do you mean? Yeah. So basically, what happened is like I was like chaperoning Fnatic from the side as chairman, um, watching it grow, supporting it where I could. Um, and you know, in the meantime, I'd brought in a CEO who is now running the agency business whilst I was running the product business inside of Neverbland, the products we created, um, we, we, we'd we gotten a product up to be in a pretty good place, Slate, where we had like maybe like it was a B2B SaaS product for, for agencies to pitch. And it's still going today, by the way. And so is Neverbland. Like they're all still going today. So, um, and then we started talking. And you're still to, a shareholder and et cetera, et cetera. Do you turn up for meetings or? Well, we just, I just sold actually. Yeah. I just sold. So I sold uh, Slate, um, uh, in 2015 to a New York company called Extreme Reach. Um, and that was where I was like, okay, well, I, 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 unless I raise funds and I wanted to, I was thinking about building like a, a you know, Betaworks style structure where I was like building tons of internal startups and raise capital for that. Or I go back to Fnatic and one of the hardest things about, you know, probably a lot of your audience is trying to get customers is probably the hardest problem for, for, for tech startups, right? Like a lot of tech startups are engineers. A lot of them are like marketing people. They're like, great at building a product or, you know, the product market fit. And then they've kind of like not great at marketing or getting customers or really scaling. And, and that doesn't come natural to them. Whereas Fnatic had had the opposite problem, right? We'd, we'd have millions of followers across social media. We had tons of customers, but we didn't really have a product that was like generating us significant revenues. We were just relying on some sponsorship deals. And that's when I was like, okay, I've sold Slate. I, I can actually come back to Fnatic now and actually take my product knowledge and like, you know, basically start to create a vertical integration and start to have more value generated by, by doing our own products. Um, and that's basically where, you know, I basically said, hey, you know, Scott, I'm going to go back to Fnatic. Um, and that's the kind of whole transition from being, you know, what had been, I guess, the early, early dark ages of esports. And then, you know, while I was at Neverblind, it was like the middle ages of esports. And then kind of around 2016, when Twitch got bought for a billion dollars by Amazon, it entered the kind of, I don't know, the, the, the modern era. Um, mm -hmm. And that's when I came back to basically raise our first outside capital, buy my mom out, buy a hardware company, and start running Fnatic, basically. Okay, so during this time of, of you being at Neverbland and staying on the, you know, the side of the business that, um, you know, was, was essentially 
there was product market fit. People want tech products. You were building, you were designing, etc. Who was running Fnatic? What was your involvement there? Like, how did that work? And was it like a bit much at times? Did you feel like quite a lot of stress, like having these sort of two worlds, so to speak? Or did you try and, you know, separate yourself from Fnatic for the time being and go all in on Neverbland? Yeah. So, I mean, the reality is, is that like I had my mom and I had Patrick and Patrick was our kind of like CGO who, who was, used to be the Counter-Strike captain. And he I'm became... assuming that's chief gaming officer for anyone. Exactly. Yeah? yeah. Bingo. Which I created by the way, as a title. And now there's like every team in the world has a CGO. It's kind of crazy. Um, but it, there's loads of little things like that where you're just like, oh, it's cool. I created that, that like position in the world, <laughs> you know, and now it's a, it's a, in the esport world, it's a common position anyway. But the, the, you know, basically I was like kind of chaperoning, trying to like stop my mom and Patrick fighting too much. And, you know, at the end of the day, like my mom was a very good doer, but she was also kind of like not a great leader. You know, she was very emotional. She was extremely like, you know, she was fair. But at the same time, she, 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 and, and, and always like paid the bills and always like sorted out like the kind of finances and was, and it was very ruthless and probably what was needed in that time. But if we were to scale, we needed like a more risk taking like approach. And at the same time, you know, my mom was kind of, you know, time that she had retired a little bit, you know? <laughs> so, um, so, you know, it was tough. It was a tough challenge to like, sometimes stop Patrick from quitting and like keep the team together, especially when I'm not focused on it. Um, and, and, you know, sometimes there was, there was some significant problems and even thought about multiple times when I had offers to sell it, like maybe it's time to just like, you know, sell it and move on and I'll just become a full on tech startup guy. Um, honestly, like after being in the tech world from 2007 to 2015, like I got really tired of, you know, me to software companies like cloning other software companies it just get like it's so much more exciting to work on like brand and hardware and consumers and like millions of people it's like it just that's why i got really back excited to come back to fanatic really was this like a difficult conversation to have with your mum can you take us through oh, like, what, that conversation, what, what was that conversation like? Because we haven't had a, a situation of understanding this kind of relationship dynamic on the show before. I'd love you to just take us through it a bit. It's like truly fascinating. Yeah. So, I mean, I've always been a product person. I started a product agency. I didn't really know I was into you know, product until I started like working in tech and, and I was like, wow, I actually really love design. I love the details. I love the tiny. And so one of the things that I, I recognize is that Fnatic was making probably like three to 4 million in revenue back then, which was like four times how much money we were making back then for our hardware partner, because we had Fnatic branded products and they were selling it. It was a company called Steel Series, And I, I quickly realized like, well, hold on a minute. Like A, their products aren't that great. B, why don't we just do this ourselves? Um, and, and see, like, that's kind of what I want to do. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I started to look uh, at the time for opportunities to basically buy a hardware company. Um, and it, it came to a point where we found this hardware company and, and, and we went deep into this process. And then my mom kind of backed out at the last minute. And, and that's what it was like, the kind of like, you know, we put all this work into it and then she just like refused to sign a document and it was just like all right well n there's something has to shift because we can't be like equal partners in this thing and if i'm going to come back full time on this then you know we need to to, to sort this out and so i kind of got mediated with my with a couple of friends of my mom's and we you know because my mom was being extremely emotional about it and and at the same time i was like mom you know if we want this thing to thrive and I'm coming back to it, I need, I, I don't, I can't have you full time in this business, you know? And so, you know, we basically just agreed an offer, which was like basically a million dollars for <laughs> almost like, uh, I would say like 35% of the company, um, back, uh, you know, and, and, and with that 35%, I basically went out, acquired this hardware company. I then raised our first bit of capital, raised 2 million on a 17 million valuation. Um, and, and basically began the, the kind of next phase of Fnatic where now we're a product company, you know, now I'm back in the business, but not CEO yet. Um, and, 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 you know, ultimately my mom recognizes it was the right thing to do and that she was like, 
you know, it, she's now enjoying retirement by constantly traveling and like always on the go and, 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 and just having, you know, fun. So I think it was just, I think it's, it's hard when like never bland had been my, like all my learnings from reading that everything about starting a business, you know, how to build, how to hire, how, you know, reading books by Joel Spolsky and like, you know, get smart and get, get shit done. You're doing all of that. And then coming back to fanatic and like trying to like change this monolithic, like tanker, which has been built from the complete opposite of what, like the tech way of building things, you know, the startup way of like hiring and five V to five people interviewing process. Anyway, it was, it was a, it's been a, crazy journey to get where I am today from, from, from that sense. And, and how many, how many people did your mom have at the time and where were you based? So we're based in London. We're based in Shoreditch. We'd, we'd set up an office actually. Um, I mean, obviously because it was close by to where I was. Um, and, uh, it was, it was in, uh, yeah, basically an apartment where we were about 15 people, um, uh, that we'd turned in the living room into like an office. Uh, which are probably is illegal, but you know we're not in it anymore, so it's too late. But <laughs> um, but and besides, um, it'd be coming for your mom, not you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and so yeah, it was like it, it was, the, and the, like back then, you know, like my mom had never like hired people; she'd hired physios. You, you vet them on physio. It's the the reality is that we'd hired a bunch of people who were kind of like volunteers slash like interns that then just kind of stumbled into like you're now running all of our global sales you know <laughs> like, um so that it was it, it's definitely if you had to start a company from scratch you wouldn't it would it, you know in hindsight it probably would have been better to just like kept like kept the brand and then just rebuilt the entire team but instead it was like attrition you had to like one in one out like oh, i don't want that function to drop off but that took like two and a half three years which is probably in hindsight just pull the band-aid off suffer for like two or three years or rather sorry two or three months as you're hiring the people and then but probably move much faster yeah fascinating thank you for sharing that um i'm guessing like you know the the questions that i've got around that uh, you know, was there a, a period of time where you and your mom had a strange relationship because of this? Or did you sort of, after the mediation, just agree like this is what's happened, this is the outcome, like let's go back to essentially like a, a normal parent-child relationship rather than professional one? You know, like, how do you have that conversation? I mean, I think that's that was the main point for me. It, was, it wasn't just the like, I want to run the business. It was like, you're no longer my mom. You're like, only thing is like constantly like why aren't we doing this why aren't we doing that why aren't we doing this and it's just like you know mom i just want i just want you to like ask how my life is and like us to just talk about like you know what the uk weather is like you know <laughs> Come on, let's talk about like you know what we ate for breakfast i like i know it sounds mundane but like it just became constant i couldn't like every time i'd have a conversation with her because i was running another company it would be like i need to ask you about this in fanatic i need to ask you about this in fanatic and it was just that that is like a real hard place to be and 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 you know so actually afterwards it was basically a rule that we just don't talk about fanatic i was like you know f and, and it because it was like it was more about changing her behavior of like stopping those frequent questions all of the time um and 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 from my side like mom can you know i love you like you know obviously we're very similar as personalities so like it's better if we just just let me run it for a bit you know like let me do this <laughs> okay so moving forward you said you raised a couple of million dollars you did a 17 million dollar valuation you're not ceo yet but you're back inside the company that you founded and you're kind of finding your feet What's that experience like? And you know, how did you make the transition back into CEO? Did you make that transparent inside the company that was your desire and what you'd be doing over a period of time? Or were you kind of enjoying being part of the company culture without having to take full responsibility? Yes, I mean, very deep questions there. Like, oh, the reality is, is that like, I'd been CEO at Neverbind and I'd, I'd really gotten kind of scarred because I, I I just wanted to work on product. I didn't want to work on customers. I didn't want to, I just wanted to work on like, and, and, and in running an agency, it's like, it's, it's, there's lot, there's not many levers you can pull. Whereas, 
in a company like Fnatic, it's, it's, it's a completely different structure. If you think about an agency, it's really just like 20 different companies in one because you have every pod that's working on a different client. It's almost like a new company. And, and then there's a layers of management, but really it's, you're not really working together. You're working individually as creative pods. Whereas in a company like Fnatic, especially is you've got every department, you know, from talent to marketing, to content creation, to back office, finance, legal, they all have to work in like harmony, which, which means that like, there's kind of, it's more complex, but it's also in a way more rewarding because when they're working together, it's like moving fast. So to, basically, I, you know, coming back to Fnatic, I was like, I don't want to be CEO. I want to just focus on the stuff I want to work on, which at the time, so I became like full-time executive chairman effectively. Um, and, you know, at the time I'd, I'd hired a CEO into Fnatic called Wouter, um, who, you know, was probably like one of the first like real kind of operational businessmen type people that I'd met in the gaming world. Um, and you know, he, he, he'd done a great job of like professionalizing what was effectively a family run business. Right. So he'd started to like put in budgeting and like put in stuff like that, which made sense, you know, because you're, and, 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 but you know, coming back, I'd obviously built this team in Neverbland where every single person in that company was sick. They were like incredible designers, incredible developers, you know, now they're running like Facebook design, Google design, you know, all over the world There's like ex Neverland alumni doing cool shit in massive companies, um, you know, Google Labs, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, 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 it, it was like it, it, having that talent and then coming back to like this, oh my God, I don't even know where to start. You know, like I have to like rebuild an entire like speed, speedboat from the inside of a tanker, you know, like that's kind of how it felt. Um, and, and so I kind of worked in silo and then, you know, and, and did, you know, slowly, but surely I brought some never bland people in, I brought in some like, um, you know, new people and you know, it, 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 it wasn't until kind of like 2018 where I was like, no, I, if I need to, this, this is not moving fast enough, this co kind of CEO relationship where I'm like chairman and basically running the company and you're also CEO is like conflicting. Um, and so we basically had a, a mutual discussion that like it's time for him to kind of, you know, move on. It'd been like four years. Uh, he's now CEO of Excel, which is another London based esports team. Um, and, and I, I, you know, I wanted to move faster. I wanted to make bigger changes. Uh, and, and that's basically why I took back the CEO position and, and, and honestly, like best decision I've, I've made. <laughs> like it, it, it's just, you, 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 some, at some point you've got to realize that like, it, what maybe you weren't good at CEO in a previous position. Actually, you know, when you look at what a CEO does, which is effectively judge and, and, and hire the talent, uh, make so basically make sure you've got great people, you know, f find the cash, AKA sales to, to run the business, build the vision and strategy so that everyone can get behind with well, the three things that I'm like, you know, and, all, and, and probably in a tech world, be really good at product. Like I really think a CEO should be great at product, and and that's kind of basically what my skill sets were. And it took me to be like, yeah, realizing that. I guess you're muted. Can't hear you. Hello, 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 hello. I can't hear anything. Enable mic. Can you hear me now? Yeah, now, now I can hear. Yep. Oh, it's doing that. Seems to be. Yes. Now I can hear you. You can hear me now. Yeah. We don't know what happened. I'm sorry. Um, You're still sorry. recording. Still recording. It says it's I recording. Might... It looks like it's done a, a backup anyway, which is fine. Um, or it might be split into two recordings. So, 
be fine. Okay, I've got a, we've both got local audio back up anyway, so it actually isn't a problem. Yeah, I just, just had in to case. Start, um, start my audio recording again because it stopped, but now it's back on again. Just now it stopped when I pulled my headphones out. Really? Okay. Actually, yeah. do you want to give me a second? What I'll do is I'll make sure that I'm just doing a, another backup of the local audio, and then we'll have okay. no problems whatsoever. Okay. Give me one sec, mate. Just getting into the juicy question as well. <laughs> I'm getting excited for this one. Let's just change my batteries of my local so there's no mistakes. Crazy, I didn't know any of this stuff regarding um, your mum's. It's such a good story. I'm so glad we're doing this, mate. It's really <laughs> fucking awesome. Um, okay. I mean, it's funny when you look back and you're like, how many challenges you've just gone through? Like, it's like, holy shit, I did all those things. 100%. It's funny. I mean, this is what guests always say, but it's like fun to, fun to do podcasts on the basis of like actually being able to record them in a sequ like sequential, but also emotional yeah. level. Yeah, totally. Um, cool. Are you ready to record on your side again? I'm recording. Great. I'm recording too. Okay. So you've come back to your company, you've taken over the CEO role, you've had a lot of these challenging kind of conversations as well, which is you know, really fascinating to hear how, uh, how you've approached them. And you've got this kind of vision. So you mentioned you did like a $2 million round. You've then, um, I'm assuming, done an intern uh, around they're off for a series a is that right yeah exactly and how did you how did you go about that what was the valuation and i guess this is obviously leading up to the fact that you know you've just done a fantastic crowdfunding round where your valuation was a hundred million dollars so you know this is sort of the people that want to know well what is the real value in doing a, a, a an esports team right how big can those companies go um you know a hundred million dollar valuation seems 130 super, pardon 130 or let's do this million pounds. all right let's let's record this a little bit again then let's get this completely spot on 100 100 million pounds 130 million dollars yeah yeah cool cool okay so you've come back into your business you've taken over the role of ceo and you know you've essentially pioneered a new path for your team where before let's say it was just some people really like really in an apartment turned office up until most recently, a couple of months ago, you just raised on crowdfunding a whopping $130 million valuation round. So for people that are questioning how big esports can go, obviously to you, it's the moon, right? Like anyone investing <laughs> in a business at $130 million have to believe that it's going to 10x from there. Otherwise, there's no point in them doing it, which means that people, everyone, myself included, as you know, I'm an investor proudly um, of your company. Yep. Uh, you know, you. Has to believe, yeah, has to believe it's going to be a billion dollar opportunity, which I do. So, you know, let's talk about how you got it to that point as well. Yeah. So, I mean, raising our first bit of capital was obviously challenging, but at the same time, you know, it, it became, you know, now we've got to become a startup. And that means we've got to basically change almost every person in the company. And I don't mean that because they were the wrong people, but they were the wrong people for scale. Like we needed heavy hitters that have done this before, but no, yeah. And, and, and then in, in areas where we, where you need that at esports experience, you, you've kept it. So like Patrick is still here today. He's a co-owner of the company. He's a very pivotal part of our, our business. But the reality is, is that like, we are, uh, we went through kind of this phase where we're like, we need to raise, um, you know, a, a big round. We wanted to raise around 15 million. Um, and we, we brought in uh, a company called GP Bullhound, um, which you may have heard of. And they, they kind of structured us, you know, the, this very specific way where um, it's kind of like how a tech company would raise, right? So we went through the pitches. We, we, we spoke with them like, and, and prepared for it. They then like lined up probably nearly 100 companies to go and meet with. Um, and what ensued was, unfortunately, and this was not, you know, their fault necessarily, was just, it was 2017. So there was like 
pretty much still an early adoption of esports in the VC world and the tech world. And really what ended up happening was I educated about a hundred different tech companies on at VCs on what is the world of esports and where it's going. Um, and you know, from that, there was only one investor that really came through and, 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 and the, 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 that was like a really tiring process for me because I spent almost like a year kind of raising this capital, trying to get it together. Um, the Americans had come off the back of that, you know, they get sport, right? And they have a bunch of billionaire sports people, like hundreds probably of billionaire sports people. And so the American teams had just raised like 40 million, just like that, you know, 50 million. Whereas like you're based in London, you're like, well, okay, well, we've got to compete with these guys. And we, you know, not compete on spending, but just, you know, be able to like compete on buying players or getting players and be able to afford to operate. And I think that's, you know, so we ended up pulling in what I think is a really great set of investors. So we have, um, you know, Berengia, which is the only institution we have based in London, but but really it's mostly driven by family offices. So, you know, we've got an Indian family office uh, in Unbound, um, you know, who, who are mostly known for telecoms in Africa and, and India. Um, we've got the founder of VK.com, you know, not, not the one that made Telegram, but the other one, which is Lev Leviev. Um, and he, uh, he, he's been really helpful and supportive of our business. And then we've got like a Hong Kong family office as well as, uh, as well as, an, you know, a number of angels and, 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 and whatnot. And we managed to pull it together by hook or by crook, uh, to get a $19 million round done. Um, and that was, you know, that was the beginning of kind of, uh, the, the, uh, now it's like, I've got the remit to go and get all the people. That's when, you know, I announced that in April of 20, um, uh, 2018, um, and basically became the CEO of the business again, and uh, ultimately, you know, ended up like hiring what I think now is such an incredible team. And I'm so excited to go to work every day to work with these people who are in pretty much every position, like better than me, you know, and that's, what's, that's, that's, what's exciting when you've got an exec team where, and, and a leadership team where, you know, they, they've come from, like they've just sold their company for 300 million to, to a US company or you know another one was it, it, it's just it's just an incredible experience to 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 have such heavy hitters around you and just uh, on a technical basis you know you mentioned the reason you really need the money is so you can afford the players what does a typical player cost in in esports what does a top player cost what is that kind of license are you buying them for a year is it a contract for a few years how does that work yeah so that was a slight misnomer i would say that like the reality is, is that we were trying to do much more than most other teams with much less capital. So the the reality is we're three things as a business, right? We're an esports operation where we're competing in the biggest title and we're getting money from media rights, we're getting money from the league sponsor sales. Then we're brand partnerships team. So we work with some of the most forward thinking brands in the world, you know, big brands like BMW, AMD, Monster Energy. Um, and we work with them to basically appeal to youth culture, not just to have a logo on a shirt, but really to create content and, and be an, an agency for them in some ways for this world. And then finally, uh, and this is very unique to us, is that we're a product company. So we have our own gear, we have our own clothing lines, uh, and that's one of the fastest growing part of our, of our, our business. Um, in terms of like, you know, the money, so the money was being used, yes, for managing what is a very expensive esports operation, um, and, and of course, you know, some of the top players in our team are earning hundreds of thousands, you know, one of them is earning over 500,000. So a year, and this is just from salary. Um, mm -hmm. so this is the kind of level you're talking about where, where, where you, the players and, and your know, players are getting bought for millions of dollars. Now, you know, a, a player from a competitor team was just bought for $5 million. Um, you know, we've sold players for hundred, you know, mid, mid, mid millions but not not really above a million as of yet um there hasn't been yet, but uh but it could be soon so uh we'll see but it, it is it's like any other sport right there's a transfer window there's scouting there's academy programs there's youth programs and and we're trying to be you know one of the the best at developing talent because that's what we stand for and and that means that you know we always or generally have been net positive when it comes to transfers okay firstly like awesome and so happy for you that you found your calling with all the passion that you've got um you know 16 years in really like running the company and um, such a high growth one at that it's just lovely and i love these stories on secret leaders where you're speaking to someone who is easy to see fanatic just raised a hundred million dollar 
um, often during 30 million dollar valuation round, etc. I kind of want to be like Sam, or oh, why isn't my esports team like that? You know, 16 years in the making, like this is such a common story um, <laughs> with, with entrepreneurs. You know, it's usually over a decade of hard grind and no one knowing about them, giving a shit or having any interest. And so yeah. Um, I love the passion and dedication and I'm so happy there's that like groundswell so often the thing you know with with success is is timing right it's the patience though the timing doesn't happen around you you've got to be in it and learning Absolutely. and you've got to stick to it um how close do you think you were to quitting and throwing the whole thing in I mean you, you, you know once I came back like never like that doesn't I mean for me it's like the, the the different periods were really necessary. I had to go and 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 build Fnatic and realize that it's an esports team and it's not going to scale as fast as I'd like it to scale, right? And then had to create a tech startup and realize, wow, building a team, a tech team is hard. You know, getting product market fit and money is hard. And then you know, I had to run an agency to realize that, damn, like you know, working for others and building like services business is not for me. Uh, and but through all those things, I learned you know everything about tech product building. I built an incredible network. You know, I pretty much know you know m the bulk of the London tech scene founders because of that period where mm -hmm. every, we were all there grinding with like one or two people, <laughs> etc. Um, uh, and 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 then you know coming back to Fnatic, I, I had to have done that stint in tech to realize that like you know what I want to work on is something which is super hard, super complex and super forward thinking and future. And, and I think now we're running a business, which is, you know, part, part sports team, part hardware company, part software company, and part agency. And it's like, it is extremely complex, but mm -hmm. at the same time, it is so damn exciting because every day I'm looking at like new funny video content we've created or another like cutting edge headset design or a Gucci collaboration or a BMW wrapped with a Fnatic logo. It's just like the most fun job in the world to have all of that stuff happening and then have like 4,000 people buy into your company who are just fans because they want to be along for the ride. You know, that's, that's, you know, I definitely am not thought about giving in the towel. You know, I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, I think that's what most entrepreneurs are like, right? We're kind of like, if you're, there's obviously a time at which you break or you, you're, you're, you're getting to the end of your tether. Um, and, and that's either going to be because you're working too hard and you need to take a break and it's okay to let the company, you know, to, to, to run on its own for a little bit, or it's because, you know, you've actually reached the end of, 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 of the possibilities of that business. Um, I, I think the fanatic possibility is, is still just beginning. I know it sounds crazy, but like, you know, we haven't even touched on the viewing experiences of AR or VR. We, you know, the Ready Player One stuff is real. Like Roblox is real. Like this multiverse situation is going to mean that like, yeah, physicality will come to esports and it'll play a big part of, of, of making esports games. And, and suddenly, yeah, we will have competition for rugby and baseball and all of these sports with these super engaging, highly accessible titles and, and sports. Yeah, it's super, super exciting. Um, before we go, I'd love to know what your perspective is on the hardest day you've had in your business. What was the hardest moment and how did you how did you deal with that day? I mean, I think like it, there's obviously so many hard moments. Um, you, you know, I, I could think back to, 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 to loads of them. Um, I think it, the hardest day ever was basically um, around 2008, the end of 2008. And, um, you know, I kind of had Fnatic really struggling um, with cash and leadership. Um, and at the same time, you know, Ugame had just died basically because of, of, of not having you know, money and, and funding. Um, and it was just like, you know, some, I think we'd lost a sponsor or something. And it was, it was just like, we weren't going to be able to pay anyone, we weren't pay the players. And it, it was that, like at that moment, you know, before I'd really had any success that I was like, 
you know, this is going that I, I'm not, maybe, maybe I'm not good at this. Like actually, I don't, how, what, what made me think that I was an entrepreneur? Like, like, what, well, why did I think I would ever be good at this? And it was like, you know, uh, you, like failures of failures and you, cr you start crying a little bit. And, um, and at that point I was like, you know, I fell asleep and I woke up and it was just like, you know, it's it suddenly like the clouds parted, like, well, oh, I'll do this, I'll do this, I'll do this. And suddenly it's like, you just find a way. And, and, and that's happened like never to that level of low because, you know, once that was before you built up that inner confidence that like, yeah, I'm actually good at this. You know, I can get people to, to believe me. I can lead. I know I'm, I'm empathetic. You know, I, I'm a kind person. You know, these things like once you have that belief, like it's, it doesn't phase you. At the end of the day, I could, everything could fall down and die tomorrow in what I do. And I'm confident that tomorrow I could build it again. I mean, poetry. It's lovely. <laughs> um, what's the best piece of advice anyone's ever given you, Sam? Uh, I think I get so much good advice from amazing people. Um, I, I think the, the, the advice has always been, you know, kindness is underrated. And I, I think that people in business is, are often, you know, the reality is, is this is just about managing people. Everything is about understanding what are the inner desires of other people and what, what are the inner desires of your team and it, you're basically a psychoanalyst every single moment of every day. And and so, yeah, kindness is underrated because it's always going to come back to you and people are going to work for you again and investors might come back and all of these things. I think it's just, you know, it, it just leaves a lasting impression which will help you for years to come. Amazing. Thank you, Sam. It's been awesome to chat to you on your journey. Can you tell us where we can find Fanatic and yourselves to follow you on social, et cetera, please? Yes, it's Fanatic without the first A. So it's F-N-A-T-I-C dot com on every social media platform. So Fanatic, on the, at Fanatic. Amazing. Sam, it's been such a pleasure. Thank you, dude. No worries. Thanks, man. Catch you soon.